Blood on the River, Chapter 6, Page 35 Whilst we remained at this island, we saw a whale chased by a thresher and a swordfish. They fought for the space of two hours. We might see the thresher with his flail lay on the monstrous blows, which was strange to behold. In the end, these two fishes brought the whale to her end. Master George Percy, Observations These islands are strung together much like beads on a necklace. When we sail past one, in half a day we catch sight of another. I sneak up on deck so often my back is sore from being smacked with that oar. But the sky and water are so blue and everything is so new, I keep coming up anyway. It is hot. We boys and common men abandoned our shoes, stockings, doublets, and slops weeks ago. Now even the gentlemen go around with their white, knobby knees, peeking out from under their long shirt tails. We anchor near the island of Guadalupe, and Ca Captain Newport takes several men ashore to explore. While the boats are anchored, we passengers are allowed up on deck, and so I stand at the railing to watch the long boats glide through water clear as turquoise glass. A strong hand closes on my arm, and I startle. It is Captain Smith. Look, he says, pointing. A huge black form comes racing through the sea. Close behind it are two smaller forms. It's a type of whale. The biggest fish in the sea, Captain Smith says. Then he smiles strangely. It is being chased. The three fish disappear behind the discovery, then reappear on the other side. What would chase a whale? I ask. Looks like a swordfish and a thresher shark, says Captain Smith. We will see who wins. The whale surfaces and spurts out a spray of air and water. In that moment, the thresher rears up its tail and lands a tremendous blow on the whale's snout. The whale is stunned. He tries to escape, but the swordfish swims in to cut him. Bright red blood swirls into the clear water. The thresher lands another harsh blow and another. The whale becomes confused, swims in circles. The swordfish darts in and out, cutting and slicing. Soon the once blue water is murky with blood. As the whale slows, the thresher deals more slamming blows, and the swordfish cuts again and again. Finally, the whale rises to the surface, spurts a stream of spray one more time, then rolls over, belly skyward. Captain Smith has a satisfied look on his face as if his regiment had just won a battle. You see how it is when you've left the confines of England? He asked me. You might have been born the biggest fish in the sea, but the skill and perseverance of those lower born can take you down and destroy you. Somehow I know that he is talking about Master Wingfield, the biggest fish in the sea. I glance around to see who else has heard. I see Master Clovel glaring at us, and I wonder how long Captain Smith will remain unshackled if he keeps talking this way about the gentleman. Land ho! I hear the familiar shout. It must be another island, but then I hear more. Is this where we'll drop anchor, Captain, and take all the men on shore? Yes, have the bosun ready, the longboat. I run up on deck. They'll be too busy now to catch me. The day is a rare, overcast one, and the sails reflect the gray of the sky. The Susan Constant turns. Sailors rush to pull on lines, and we are on our way, gliding into shore. As we get closer, I see the tall trees. They've got huge green leaves at their tops, and their bare trunks curve upwards like fingers reaching for the sky. I see a bright green and yellow bird fly from one treetop to another. Land. I wonder if I'll remember how to walk on it. Fetch the tents. Lower the longboat. Men, gather your belongings. We are going ashore. I gladly, very gladly, help load bedding, tents, pots, and pans onto the longboat to be taken ashore. The Godspeed and the Discovery anchor nearby as well, and their men unload. This will be the first time since we left England that all of us, all 105 of us men and boys who are passengers and three crews of sailors will be together in one place. There are probably Carib Indians on the island, Captain Newport tells us, but we will give them beads and our soldiers will stand guard at night and we'll be safe. I'm one of the last to go ashore. When I finally stand on the white sand, it feels as if it's moving under me. I laugh out loud. 
More than three months on a ship has confused my legs so much that solid land feels like the rocking deck. Samuel, look. We're carib Indians, James calls to me. He and Richard have taken off their shirts and they're running naked through the water, splashing each other. I have been waiting for James or Richard, or both, to tell me how I was wrong and they were right about the Caribs. But neither of them has. I have been on my guard, ready to rough them up that they say one word about it. Are they taunting me now, showing me what naked Caribs look like, telling me I was wrong not to believe them? Come on, Samuel! James stands in waist-deep water, dripping wet. His skin is peak pale, and his fair hair is plastered against his head. It's salty, he says, and licks some water from his hand. It's fun. Come swim with us. I blink at him. No taunting? No insisting they were right and I was wrong? No hating me for how badly I've treated him and Richard this whole journey? I wonder if James can really be this forgiving, or if he is simply so happy to be off that stinking ship that he has forgotten the path. Come on in, you prig, calls Richard. You need a good delusim. That makes me mad. You're the one who brought that lice onto the ship, I shout. I yank off my shirt and charge into the water. I splash Richard in the face until he begs for breath. When I stop, he is gasping. He smiles a little, as if he wants to pretend it was fun. But I know it was not. My eyes dare him to try and splash me back, or insult me again. I know he will not. He doesn't want to lose another tooth. Stop, you two, James whines. Look at the fish. He tries his best to distract Richard and me from our quarrel. I feel tickling on my legs. When I look down into the clear water, I see small blue and yellow fish nibbling on me. The water is warm, so much warmer than the Thames. I want to live here forever, says James. I'd never go back to my stepmom ever. She would think I'd died and that would make her happy. I want to stay here too, says Richard. I wouldn't be cold ever again. I shake my head. I still want to go to Virginia, I say. There's a sack of gold waiting for me there. Maybe ten sacks. Reverend Hunt calls to us from shore. Boys, come here. Put your shirts on. The sun will burn your skin. I wish we didn't have to leave the water, but we do what Reverend Hunt says. Disobeying him would be like disobeying God. When we get to shore, he is holding our shirts and three wide-brimmed straw hats. The sun here is like ten English suns, he says. You put these on. The Rev Reverend Hunt waits while we pull our shirts over our heads and tie the hat strings under our chins. Now, he says, there is work to be done. There are the tents to be set up, the cook wants all the pots scrubbed with sand, and Captain Ratcliffe wants a path cut to the baths. They found hot baths in the forest, and he says the gentleman can't be tromping through the underbrush to get to them. Captain Rat Ratcliffe of the beady eyes and pointed nose. Captain Smith grumbles that he didn't doesn't see why the gentleman can't walk through the forest like anyone else. But, Rat but Captain Ratcliffe has the power to give orders, not Captain Smith. When we join the others, I see the older boy, Nathaniel. He is holding a hatchet. He must be on his way to help clear the path. I don't want to scrub pots like a woman, so I hurry to get one of the hatchets, too. I swing it a few times to feel its weight and power. I want to do a man's job. Henry, Abram, Nathaniel, and several of the sailors start toward the forest with their hatchets. I follow them. What do we have here? Henry turns to look at me, then stops to block my way. Scrawny chicken coming to work with the men? I don't answer. I want to say I wouldn't be so scrawny if he'd leave more f of the food for me. I try to skirt around him and continue on my way, but he puts out one powerful arm to stop me. Go back and scrub pots with the other boys, he growls. You only get in the way. He yanks the hatchet out of my hands and cuffs me. I glare at him silently as he turns and walks after the others. What is he going to do with two hatchets? I hope he chops himself in the leg. Reluctantly, I go find the cook. He is already hovering over Richard and James, showing them how to scoop a, up a handful of sand with a rag and use it to scrub out the mess pots. They haven't had a really good cleaning in three months, so the sand has some hard work to do. I join them, toiling under the hot sun, 
and sweat drips from my face. I wish you could be back playing in the salty sea, or swinging a hatchet in the shade of the forest. Suddenly, a scream comes from the forest. A man's scream of pain. Soon, there is another cry, and then such shouting and shrieking, it turns my blood cold. I remember Captain Smith's answer when I asked if the Caribs chop people up for their cook pot. Only if they catch them. The path cutters, I shout. It's coming from that direction. Gentlemen and soldiers grabbed their weapons and hurried toward the terrible sound. James and Richard huddled together behind the largest cook pot. I spot a sword and belt someone had left lying in the sand. Quickly, I try to fasten the belt around me. It's too big. I pull the sword out of its sheath, and with the bare sword, I run toward the sound of the battle. Down the newly cut path I go, high-stepping over stumps and roots, following the soldiers and gentlemen. We all converge on the path cutters. They are yelling and writhing as if they are fighting invisible demons. Henry is hopping, swatting his arms and neck, shouting in agony. There is not a Carib Indian in sight. What is this? Reverend Hunt demands his voice booming over the cries. What is happening here? Fire! Henry cries. It feels like fire! I jerk my head around, searching the jungle. Have the caribs attacked and run off? Or is it some strange beast? I hold out my sword, ready to fight, but I see nothing. The hatchets are all on the ground. Reverend Hunt reaches to pick one up. No, Reverend, don't touch it. It's Captain Smith's voice. Angry red welts are rising on Henry's arms and neck, on Abram and the others too. To the bats, Captain Smith orders them. That will give you some relief. They take off running, swatting at themselves as they go. It's the machineel tree, Captain Smith says when things have quieted down. The caribs use its sap to poison the arrows and it burns like fire. Our men must have chopped into it. I am impressed with Captain Smith's knowledge. As a soldier... He has already traveled the world and learned so much. Tromping up the newly cut path at that moment is Captain Ratcliffe. His face is dripping with sweat. This all happened, Captain Smith says loudly, thanks to Captain Ratcliffe and his ridiculous idea of a gentleman's path. Captain Ratcliffe wipes his brow and scowls. It looks to me as if he would spit in Captain Smith's face if he weren't so overheated. The two men stare at each other, fuming. Let's go, everyone. Back to your work, Reverend Hunt says. With a wave of his hands, he gets the men moving. It somehow breaks the standoff between Captain Smith and Captain Ratcliffe. Captain Ratcliffe calls after the men. I want a new crew to cut the path. Just leave those blasted match and match of whatever trees alone. Captain Smith shakes his head and mumbles angrily under his breath. I walk back toward the stack of mess pots, waiting to be scrubbed. I carry the sword I borrowed. Captain Smith comes up behind me. That needs cleaning, he says. It startles me. I give him a sideways look. Then I understand he means a sword. The metal is tarnished and even rusting in some places. I will show you how to clean it, and when you return it, the owner will thank you, he says. On the beach, Captain Smith demonstrates to me how to clean the sword with a rag and sand. He says this sand is fine enough to do the job. It is surprisingly similar to cleaning and polishing mess pots. He orders me to, to do as he has shown me. I reach for the rag. Then I stop. What if I do it wrong? Will he beat me? Make a fool of me? I lower my hand. It is better to remain unteachable. If you will not obey me... Captain Smith says in a low, cold voice. There are other, crueler men you may serve instead. I clench my teeth. Nothing to do but try. I reach slowly for the rag again, scoop up sand, press it against the sword blade, and give it a stroke. I forget to be careful. My finger slides along the blade. I yelp, stick my sliced finger into my mouth, suck on the blood. Captain Smith laughs. Ah! I cut my fingers many times learning to clean a sword. Let me see it, he says. I hold out my finger. It is still bleeding, but the cut is not so deep that it will stop me from using my hand. Captain Smith rips a string off the rag and ties it tightly around my finger. Try again, he orders. I look up at him. I did it wrong, and yet he did not beat me. 
I pick up the rag again. I am careful of my fingers this time. I give a short stroke and another and another. Soon the rust and the tarnished spots have turned to shine. They gleam in the late afternoon sun. Captain Smith nods. Good, he says. Now return it to its owner before one of these lazy gentlemen calls you a thief. I run off to find the belt and sheath. They are still lying in the sand. I return the sword to its place. That evening I hear hammering, and after a while I go to see what is being built. Have some of the gentlemen decided they need houses instead of tents to sleep in? When I see what it is, my mouth goes dry. A wooden frame, a rope hanging from the highest beam, a noose tied in the rope. Master Wingfield has not forgotten his promise to hang Captain Smith.